Hello and welcome to today's episode of Vintage Sky. Today I'm going to show you an interesting history. It's not a history of a general type of an aircraft, but a history of a particular plane, the Oster Mark 6A Golf Alpha Papa Romeo Oscar. Generally the Taylor Craft Oster was the uh, military high wing uh, reconnaissance airplane uh, developed in 1939 and used throughout the Second World War. It was used mainly for directing artillery fire as a flying observation post. Methods of targeting were, um, were such at those days that support from the air was, uh, was necessary. Uh, here we talk of support uh, on the ground, but especially battleships like the Japanese Yamato had such great firepower that the guns were firing beyond the horizon. So there was no mechanical way of targeting. Guns had to be targeted by the airplanes or hydroplanes in this case, which uh, were uh, on board the battleship itself. Also, Polish aviators during the Second World War used Taylor Craft Osters. There was an um, artillery aviation squadron number uh, 663, which operated uh, at the Italian front, uh, especially during the Battle of Bologna, uh, generally about two weeks before the official end of the Second World War. And Osters were uh, built up until 1946, the Taylorcraft uh, classic version, uh, about 1400 uh, were made. They were used in the RAF up until 1957-58. Uh, and the plane we are going to uh, meet today is the Oster Mark 6A, built in 1952. It also served uh, with the RAF. Uh, it was used uh, for targeting artillery during the Korean War. Here you can see the pictures of the of the era. We see the aviator flying this plane. Uh, what is striking is that he has no uh, headsets uh, because the um, radio communication was uh, made in, in such way that there was a large uh, VHF radio which took the whole space um, for the right seat uh, and this was operated uh, by the pilot. There was also a second seat um, which was mounted sideways behind the radio and this must have been difficult for the for the pilot because the airplane was pretty loud. Then the plane returned from the Korean War, it was resprayed into desert camouflage and directed to operation during the Suez crisis in 1956, but the plane was shipped there and not uh, rigged uh, because the tactical situation uh, was such that the, the army decided not to uh, unload the plane uh, from, the, uh, from the ship, so the plane returned home to the UK where it finished its um, military career. It was then bought by uh, the military pilot command Air Commodore uh, Alan Wheeler, who used this plane privately for 21 years, and then after he passed away, uh, his widow uh, sold the airplane to the owner in the United States, where the plane was in use for 25 years, uh, and in 2000. 9 2010 it was bought by its current owners Adam and Heather Vankowski uh, who brought the plane back to the UK and use it as a family transport and as a hobby vintage plane up until today they visit many places including Poland where I could uh, I had the honor to see the airplane and uh, examine it pretty closely while the plane was in the US, you can see the pictures here, uh, it uh, could fly along the Hudson River. There was a corridor where you can take a general aviation a plane and uh, make an, um, a VFR flight uh, along the Hudson River. Obviously it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not possible anymore. Now let me show you the airplane in detail. First we have the cockpit. The all-around visibility is perfect. The plane has inline engine. It is um, very thoroughly glazed. You have the glass uh, roof, you have um, windows on the sides. Wherever you uh, look around you can see the ground, you can see uh, everything you need. So this was an important feature for directing uh, artillery uh, firepower, but it also makes uh, flying much more pleasant and uh, make the plane look very uh, light and very uh, very friendly and very elegant. 
dashboard is typically British, especially when you look at the turn coordinator with two arrows, which is powered by the gyro, which uh, is uh, rotated uh, aerodynamically by the Venturi nozzle, which is on the um, board of the airplane. You have also the um, rectangular oil pressure indicator and uh, the throttle uh, and mixture uh, knobs which are located in such place that the plane uh, has right flight stick shorter. It was retrofitted with a, a second uh, control uh, set but the left stick has a standard size, the right one had to be shortened so the throttle um, console doesn't interfere with the flight control uh, movement. One lovely detail is the clock. The clock is uh, taken out from the World War II fighter uh, Messerschmitt 109. You have the very unique to the era switches, fuel tank selector, the magneto switch and the throttle heater which has to stay on throughout the time. Above the head of the pilot there is a trimming device uh, which is very effective, as Adam said. The plane is a uh, Mark 6A version, so it has enlarged uh, stabilizer. It is very, very nice trimmer with chain, with, uh, with gear, uh, lovely crafted detail. Generally, when you take a look at the plane, you see all those push rods, lines, you have the lines which uh, control the ailerons going through pulleys around the cockpit, you have the push rods for flaps and this lovely trimmer, so this plane is very... you can see the, the mechanism living there in it, I, I, love the, I love the feeling of it. You also above the head have the compass. Uh, Adam told me how to use it, I don't remember it in detail, but generally you can um, choose your direction, you can, uh, you can then look at the indication uh, which is reflected in the, in the retractable mirror and you can um, navigate with ease with this large, uh, large device. There are also uh, very strange uh, fuel level indicators, they are in the ribs of, of wing we can say, but there is absolutely no chance of reading uh, them uh, in mid-air. You have to take a torch and look very closely and you see the gauge. It's not the, uh, let's say, the glass through which you can see the fuel level, it is the, the gauge and it's not like in modern, uh, modern airplanes like here that you just see the indication, you have to look very closely and uh, lit, have it lit to, to read it, so this is not very, <laughs> very useful uh, in, in midair. What you can also see above the head is the carbon monoxide detector. I recommend using such devices not only on board airplanes but also in your uh, kitchen or bathroom. Between the seats uh, there is a, a handbrake-like um, uh, lever uh, for operating flaps. Uh, this version, uh, unlike the uh, World War II versions, has separate uh, flaps uh, on the wing. You can see here how they, how they look like. Rudder pedals are fitted with brakes. Front wheels have independent brakes, which are operated by heels, not by toes like in many modern airplanes. The plane has a three-point landing gear with tailwheel. The landing gear is a bit higher than in the World War II version because this, this one features a larger propeller. The airplane is generally said to be easy in flight, uh, but you have to know the specification of a tail dragger, especially on takeoff and landing. In fact, Polish pilots who flew those planes during the war were um, originally artillery officers and they were just trained to fly the plane uh, and use their um, artillery knowledge in midair, so this was not a difficult plane to fly. It was capable of, of low speed flying also, which, which makes it a lot easier, especially when you're a beginner. Plane is powered by the inverted inline the Havilland Gypsy Major 10 engine. Uh, the engine is, is very loud. It has a muffler, some pre-war record airplanes uh, fitted with the Havilland Gypsy, like the RWD-5 had no mufflers, so they had to be even louder, but still it's it's very loud engine. Uh, but uh, what is most important about it is that it doesn't leak oil. 
they sometimes do but this one is in perfect shape Adam is very proud of it you can see here how the engine looks very clean very uh, very showroom condition especially when you look at those um, uh, chrome push rods uh, which are only for show but this is an American uh, version uh, so Americans like to put chrome like on the motorcycle so they put chrome on the push rods of, of the Havilland Gypsy engine so the engine in perfect shape I also like this detail that when Adam opened the engine for me he used the actual vintage tool original for this airplane. Here you can see some details of the airplane including the ports of taking fuel samples for inspection including the zips on the wing which you can open and uh, and have a look inside. You can also see the mirror the plane was used for towing gliders i'm not sure about uh, this actual but generally the type was uh, was a tug uh, you can also see the element blocking the door in open position very useful to struts and uh, and a step which is not to be mistaken for a strut when you get in or out uh, the airplane uh, you can also see the lovely handcrafted copper spinner which was originally made for this very airplane and it was taken away but uh, sometime uh, later uh, Adam managed to find it and fit it back onto the airplane it came out of originally. So this would be about it um, uh, considering this uh, lovely airplane in Poland it is not very common to see such an airplane so I was very interested um, and I was told that if we flew uh, an Antonov 2 to the UK it would be evenly interesting for the British pilots which for us is very common airplane. I'd like to thank very much Adam and Heather for letting me be their guest on board this lovely airplane, showing me the story, the mechanisms and everything I asked about. Uh, I wish them many, many happy and safe flying hours in this uh, Oster and may their gypsy never leak oil. And thank you all for watching this episode of Vintage Sky. See you in the future. I'm Marek. Thanks for watching. Bye.